From a carbon-13 NMR spectrum, we can get information about the numbers of distinct sets of chemically inequivalent carbons in the molecule, as well as some information about functional groups, typically using these chemical shift ranges and a carbon-13 correlation chart. What we don't typically get is information about the connectivity of the carbons, what's connected to what, and even how many hydrogens each carbon has connected to it. This is where DEPT comes in. DEPT carbon NMR spectroscopy is a technique used to determine the numbers of hydrogens connected to each carbon or each carbon within a chemically equivalent set. DEPT is a series of multiple spectra where the spectra, the carbon-13 NMR spectrum, is transformed based on, in a special way, based on the number of hydrogens connected to that carbon. And it takes advantage of the fact that the proton, the nucleus in hydrogen, is an NMR active nucleus as well. So we can do things to those nuclear spins, and we can do different things depending on the number of hydrogens connected to each carbon. This is the beauty and the cleverness of the DEPT experiment. And we won't get into the physics so much as learn how to interpret a DEPT spectrum to infer the substitution pattern of the carbon, whether it has one, two, or three hydrogens connected to it. Okay, so DEPT stands for Distortionless Enhancement by Polarization Transfer. We're not going to get into the physics again. And this is a series of four NMR spectra, four carbon NMR spectra, run in a special way to transform each spectrum in a particular way based on the number of hydrogens connected to each carbon. So signals are selectively transformed based on the substitution pattern of the carbon. To appreciate how to work with depth spectra and develop an understanding of what you're looking at, I think it's easiest to work in the context of an example. And so what I want to do is look at the depth spectra of this compound, which contains some CH, some CH2, and some CH3 groups. And what depth is going to allow us to do is to distinguish between these different types of carbons with different substitution patterns. This helps in assigning each signal to a particular carbon within the molecular structure. If we analyze the numbers of just chemically equivalent and inequivalent carbons in this molecule, we'll realize there are five signals total. And before I reveal those, pause the video and make sure you understand why we would expect this compound to give five signals. We have some symmetry, which is an axis of rotational symmetry running right here. And so we would expect this to give five signals, three in the aromatic region, and two kind of in the alkyl region with perhaps the blue deshielded a bit relative to the purple because of the nitrogen that that blue carbon is directly connected to. So we'd expect five signals, and to assign these signals to particular peaks, we can use the depth spectrum. So the zero degree is just our plain vanilla carbon-13 NMR spectrum, and I think it's helpful to start actually with the 90 degree spectrum, which immediately tells us which signals correspond to CH, only one hydrogen connected to the carbon, and it's these three, the red, the orange, and the green. Now, how I assigned these to particular carbons within the aromatic ring is not super important. I actually didn't check this against the actual spectrum. This was just my educated guess. The important point is these are the three CH carbons in the benzene ring um, of the compound. From here, now that we know the CHs, we can infer the CH3s from the 135 degree spectrum and the CH2s from this same spectrum, which will go negative. So here, for example, we have a negative signal that corresponds to a CH2, and there's only one type of CH2 in the molecule, these methylene groups right here. So those must correspond to this signal. And sure enough, note that it is deshielded. It is downfield relative to the purple signal, which corresponds to this one here. That's the CH3. How did we know that? Well. We have already identified these as CHs, so they are not CH3s. The only other positive signal is this one. This must correspond to a CH3. And at this point, notice we've accounted for all the signals in the original carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Here's a CH in the aromatic, here's a CH in the aromatic, and here's a CH in the aromatic region. We've got a blue alkyl signal here, CH2 and this purple signal corresponds to a CH3. So DEPT is pretty powerful. It helps us associate signals in a carbon-13 NMR spectrum with particular carbons in the molecular structure. Here's another example where we're asked to determine the structure of an alcohol with this molecular formula just from its DEPT spectra alone. It's got the following carbon-13 NMR spectra. We've got the broadband decoupled. We've got the DEPT 90. 
in the depth 135 spectrum. And before we even get into that, let's actually back up to the molecular formula and calculate the HDI. And if you do this, I'm gonna save us a bit of time and just tell you the HDI is equal to zero. C4H10 is saturated butane. And so this C4H10O still has an HDI of zero. Now, what are these depth spectra telling us? Depth 90 tells us that uh, the signals that are due to carbons with only one H attached. And depth 135 tells us about CH2s, which will go negative in the depth 135 spectrum, and CH3s, which will remain positive. CHs will also remain positive, but from the depth 90, we'll already have assigned the CHs. So let's dig in. We know we have one CH, PPM of about 30 or so. It's right there showing up in the depth 90 spectrum. In the depth 135, we already know that signal corresponds to a CH group. And so this other positive signal must correspond to a CH3. And the negative signal must correspond to a CH2. And so, in fact, we have identified all the substitution patterns of all three of the distinct sets of carbons in this compound. Just to review one more time, negative, that's a CH2, negative signal in the depth 135, always a CH2. Positive in the depth 90 is a CH, and the only remaining signal by default must be a CH3 since it's showing up positive in the depth 135 spectrum as well. And we have no quaternary carbons. That's actually worth noting, right? We have no carbons that have no hydrogens attached to them. Every carbon's got at least one hydrogen connected to it. Okay, how do we begin building out the molecule? Well, notice that we haven't thought about integrations at all because we typically don't think about integrations in carbon spectra, but we haven't accounted for all the carbons, right? There are only three signals here, and so at least one of these has to correspond to two chemically equivalent carbons, right? So that we end up with a total of four carbons in the molecular stru structure. This could be done actually a few different ways, but the way, the, the first thing I would tend to try is thinking about chemically equivalent methyl groups because these are relatively easy to move around, right? And, and position such that the molecule is symmetric. So let's just entertain the idea that this compound has two equivalent CH3 groups. Those could both be attached, for example, to the CH group. This would also make sense in terms of chemical shift with both of those showing up in the kind of alkyl region of the chemical shift scale for carbon-13 NMR. Those two signals are looking a lot like an isopropyl group. Right? And we could use the proton NMR to confirm this, for example, using splitting patterns in the proton NMR. So I'm thinking an isopropyl group might be in this thing. And notice also that this CH2 is way, way downfield, way deshielded relative to the CH and CH3. This suggests that this is close to this oxygen atom. Perhaps, for example, we have an OH group that's connected to this CH2, which is in turn connected to this CH and the isopropyl group. The resulting structure would look like this. And let's double check just to make sure this structure is consistent with everything we've talked about so far and the, the given um, depth spectra. So we have two CH3 groups. Those match up fine. We have one CH, there it is, and we have one CH2. So we, ha we do have CH2s, CHs, and CH3s, as suggested by the depth spectra, and we have no quaternary carbons. Every carbon has at least one hydrogen connected to it. This structure is also consistent with the chemical shift ideas we already talked about, with this being the most downfield, this being not quite as far downfield, and the two methyls being the farthest upfield. And so this is consistent with all the evidence we have, with the red carbon there around 69 ppm or so, the blue carbon around 31 ppm, and the two methyls right around 19 ppm. So this looks like this alcohol right here is the most reasonable structure given this depth data.